Hi, I'm Casey Wagner. I'm a senior reporter at Blockworks, um, and I'm very excited to talk about NFTs. I think we're missing one person. Um, maybe they'll come in. Uh, but I'd love to start with a brief introduction. Uh, Calvin, if you want to just start, just uh, where you are, what you're working on, and yeah. Hey, uh, great to be here, everybody. My name is Calvin. I'm the CEO and founder of Legitimate. We create physical NFTs for luxury brands and retailers. Hey, folks. Jonathan Padilla. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Sneakerdoodle Labs. We're focused on NFT data infrastructure, and we're building the next tool set to have a universal data layer for all of Web3. Nice to meet you guys. I'm Harold. I'm the CEO of Particle. And uh, we are um, basically democratizing ownership of physical fine art masterpieces, um, you know, leveraging the blockchain to do that. Great. Uh, so I wanted to start with an overview of where we are in the NFT market today. I know we saw some pretty significant highs in the early fall, late summer. Are we going to see that momentum continue? Where do you kind of think we are in terms of NFTs? I've heard the word bubble thrown out there. Uh, so I'd love to hear your thoughts. Uh, Jonathan, did you want to start? Yeah, I mean, we're at a spot right now where I think there's a lot of energy and excitement on NFTs, but let, let's be very frank. A lot of the stuff is most likely a bubble, but the technology itself is sound and will revolutionize a lot of different applications. At Snickerdoodle, we're very committed to this notion of enterprise applications and NFTs. This goes beyond just board apes and stuff being put out by Dapper. Don't get me wrong, it's really, really interesting. But what's more interesting are things like digital ID, things like tickets, receipts, coupons, licenses. This body of information will transform the way people conceive of their data, how they own it, how they monetize it, and it will be the building blocks for, frankly, a Web3 social contract that empowers the individual and puts, puts that person you know, sovereign in control of their data. Um, I'm going to probably stray away from commenting too much about the general NFT market. Uh, I will say I agree with Jonathan. There are significant real world use cases um, as it pertains to retail products today, anti-counterfeit being one of them um, that, you know, we specifically focus a lot on um, liquidity and also, you know, just supply chain and, and transparency. So. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, for me, it, definitely you have a, you have, I see a bubble in, in the kind of PFP uh, project space, um, but, you know, a lot of them actually have real communities. And for me, you know, the, the, the NFTs are going to, are, are, you know, a way to uh, gather and, and have an, 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 a community interact with, with each other and, and in, in this new way. And, um, you know, what we're doing at Particle is really bringing this, this community that, lives in this opaque world of fine art and uh, that, that's very hard to actually penetrate and, int and actually the people involved in it to interact with each other, um, bringing that um, online and bringing that to, um, on, on, the, on the blockchain via, via ownership. I think the future of NFTs really, where, where is that going to lie? It, uh, probably in, in, in actually, you know, like you're doing at, at Legitimate, is, you know, bringing, bringing the kind of the physical and the digital together and, uh, and being able to get these, these communities much more engaged and much more involved in the projects that they're passionate about. Yeah, definitely. I think the community aspect uh, really ties into collectibles and, and that kind of, I want to get in more into that. Um, but I want to talk about use cases first. Uh, I write a lot about NFT and gaming. I feel like that's a really big thing that we're talking about right now. What other use cases are there and how are you all working to get non-crypto native companies onboarded into this space? Calvin, did you want to start? Yeah, I think I want to talk a little bit about brands, specifically physical retail brands and kind of their strategy to Web3 and NFTs today. Um, a lot of it comes off as inauthentic in the, in the sense that, you know, for a skincare company like Nivea, who did their first NFT drop, they, they, they did an excellent job. But at the end of the day, it's hard to convey to consumers why a skincare company would do, you know, digital tokens or, or digital art. Um, aside from a marketing gimmick or a quick cash grab or whatever. So really what we're focusing on, you know, in terms of talking to these retailers, talking to these brands is, hey, how can you actually activate the products that you already sell day to day, whether it's sneakers, handbags, sunglasses, 
Um, how do you activate them as NFTs and use that as a catalyst to create a completely new market for your consumers and your customers? I mean, I'd say this. Let's take a step back. Brands or businesses, businesses have in Web 2 and even in Web 3 now, you have to have real metrics, real ability to show ROI. At Sigrid, we're launching some of our core products in the next several weeks. And in conversations with both Web3 firms and firms that are enterprise in Web2, we've discovered people have a real information asymmetry about how to justify spend. And if you're talking to Adidas or you're talking to any of these big brands that are getting in to Web3, the reality is most of them are flying blind. And that's a problem. You have to report into a board of directors. You have governance controls. You need basic infrastructure. So getting these use cases, it really starts with one infrastructure that is scalable and accessible. You know, a firm like Adidas or a firm like Microsoft's not going to want to pay $300 in gas fees on, on mainline Ethereum. And frankly, it's even beyond that, showing them where users are. Our core, core product at Sigurdu basically provides dashboards for enterprise users to see where their users are, uh, both in geography and in across multiple chains. And so we're really showing businesses pure profiles of their users. And once we know that, you can justify real expenditure for marketing budgets. This isn't an innovation team. This is mainline business taking advantage of this technology. And that's how you're going to get mass adoption for this technology suite. And then just to follow up there, I mean, what are some of the concerns or challenges that some of these industries face? I know you mentioned infrastructure is a big problem. What kind of, what questions do these companies have when they're thinking about entering into NFTs? It's a fair question. In my prior role, I was the global head of blockchain strategy at PayPal. I had a great team. One of my former colleagues, Liam, is somewhere here in the audience over there. But the reality is, you know, Liam and I dealt with a lot of enterprises. We had to look at enterprise architecture. How do you, as a blockchain startup, go to a large corporation and say, we want to do X, Y, Z? And no matter what it is, is it secure? Is it safe? Is it reliable? These types of conditions may seem less cool, but frankly, the compromise of getting real architecture and real gains done is going to bring in the other 95% of people who are at conferences like this. So it really comes down to understanding where businesses are being willing to hold their hand as they get into this and you know, making these things, frankly, user-friendly. Let's, let's just be candid. A lot of blockchain outside of people in this room, it kind of sucks. It doesn't really work well. Let's just be super honest with each other. And if we're honest and we can admit that, we can have the UX, UI to, frankly, get true products to market. Yeah, and, 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 and these, these, um, you know, these NFT applications, they need they need to have an actual application. It's not, you know, these brands often you have, um, you know, they just want to get into the NFT space just for the sake of it. But, um, you know, they, you, you need to have a reason why you're doing it. And th there are many reasons. We all know uh, uh, many of them of why, why you do that. But just doing it for the sake of it is, um, you know, is where, it was where you fall flat. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the, the primary concerns that brands have brought up is, is fundamentally, you know, like, like you said, they're, they're in the dark here, right? At the end of the day, we are the pioneers, everybody in this room, and especially for some of these luxury brands that, you know, you're, you're starting to see more and more in-house Web3 teams pop up, you know, a lot of, you know, Puma, Web, uh, Gucci, all, all the LVMH brands. And at the end of the day, this is an opportunity for us to really come in and say, hey, actually, this is the right way to do it. And, and you know, th there have been a lot of you know, half-baked attempts at integrating NFTs into retail strategy, into branding strategy. And, and really, in terms of what we do at Legitimate, is we, we start working with brands from day zero. And, and we, we fixate on a very specific you know, problem that they have. In most cases, with luxury brands, it's, it's counterfeit, right? It's a $400, $500 billion industry. And we're saying, hey, with NFTs and with blockchain, you can actually solve this com entire problem and provide your consumers a layer of transparency that's never been possible before. Yeah, I want to get into that more. How are NFTs changing uh, digital ownership? And what does it mean, like you said, in terms of authenticity and uh, proof of ownership? Yeah, I, I think, you know, in, in the lens of authenticity today, there are a lot of middlemen. If you think about what it takes to buy and sell, you know, 
let's say a pair of sneakers, let's say a pair of off-white Air Jordan 1s, you know, you're really trusting the stock X's of the world. You're trusting the Ebays of the world with their verified, you know, authentication programs. But you go on YouTube and you see that there are so many holes in every single step of these programs that more often than not, 80% of products that are counterfeit actually slip through this authentication product process. Sorry. Um, so, you know, with NFTs, with what we do is, is we really, you know, start working with brands from, from the beginning, from manufacturing to say, how can we bake Web3, not just into your retail strategy, but into your retail products? And that's what's really powerful. I mean, I would say this. If we think about the technology as a, as a whole, most folks assume blockchain is great for privacy. It's really not unless you're doing some sort of zero knowledge proof layer, but it is great for ownership. And the, the difference here is, frankly, things that were not practical to go to a lawyer and have a whole kind of title and contract, it's now economically viable to produce something that you can have the provenance for for a few cents. That's, that's really the benefit of NFTs. When you think about NFTs, uh, the best metaphor I think people can use is this concept of a digital Lego. Of a, it's composable, it's structurable. If you want to do anything from, from a retail product to verify that, that Versace suit is actually from Versace. You can do that. But I think more interestingly is we've seen this from the creator economy. People who have been artists their whole lives are now able to basically verify their art and have markets. And, and the use cases are immense. I mean, Snickerdoodle began with this notion of wine resellers being able to basically show the provenance of the vintage and those vintners actually benefiting from the increase in value. So, yeah, I mean, we can talk about, I think, how this is, this is going to be super, super critical for ownership. I think the true aspect that people haven't spoken about yet here is the impact it has to digital ID. And it's not just the ownership, it's the individual being truly identified and known to both consumers, to brands, so you have curation of these types of activities and a sense of who you are in Web3. It might be Metaverse or it might be some sort of hybrid between the two. But that really underscores a whole ownership layer. You have to start with the individual. Yeah, I, on, on a kind of parallel note, I would add that, um, you know, there's this concept that um, ownership enhances the enjoyment of, of, of art or, or, or of an asset. And it's actually like a chemical reaction in your brain. Um, you know, if, if you have, um, in, in our example, when you have, uh, let's say you go to the, the ICA in Chicago and you see Andy Warhol's um, Marilyn Monroe, you're going to enjoy it just like anybody else in the museum. But Ken Griffin, who owns the work of art and who loaned it to the museum, is going to enjoy it that much more. And, uh, and, and you know, these, these digital artists, or in our application a little differently, they have huge fan bases. Um, but, you know, it now enables them to enjoy that art in, in, in that, 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 you know, just that much more, which actually makes a whole world of a difference. Um, yeah. What challenges still exist around proof of ownership and security? Um, I know Twitter had a pilot program for verifying profile pictures with NFTs. There was a concern that people could screenshot the NFT, mint it as a new NFT, and it would still be considered a verified NFT. What other uh, examples of that exist, and, you know, what's the industry doing to combat it? You know, it comes down to the friction point that's endemic across all of blockchain. It is the technology advancing at light speed and, frankly, legal and regulatory issues advancing maybe at the speed of glaciers. That's generally how government works, uh, having, having worked in government, so it's, it's kind of painful. But the reality is I think once you have adjudication in, in the courts and others, other types of bodies that can verify this, this is, this is going to be super critical. Uh, I spoke to a number of experts from, from Dapper and a couple others a few weeks ago at, at uh, NYU Law School, and their sentiment is a lot of the, the big NFT firms that are representing artists and athletes, they're hiring more lawyers than engineers. And they're doing that because the jurisprudence in this space is still completely terra nova and has to be worked out. I think that fundamentally, you know, one of the mistakes that I see a lot of projects and designers, product designers, whatever, um, head, head, you know, head down is, is projecting Web3 technology into Web2 experiences. And, and 
you know, going back to the, the Twitter, the, the Twitter profile picture, you know, thread, it's really kind of taking this notion of, okay, using a, any profile picture as an avatar, um, that might not be what avatars or NFTs look like in two, three, five years, right? And in a similar way, for, for us specifically at Legitimate, you know, one of the biggest problems are the phishing scams, right? Where you have a website that looks exactly the same, like, you know, the, the actual Legitimate website. And at the end of the day, I, I fundamentally believe that the user experience paradigm for how Web3 technologies emerge in the upcoming years will be drastically different than what we're seeing today. And you could already see that happening in the sense of moving from, you know, what's considered MVP. And, and I, I say this in the lens that this whole space is an MVP right now. And we, we have a lot of work to do. Right. Um, so yeah, we, we've talked about NFTs and gaming. We talked about real estate, uh, virtual identities. What's next in the space and how can the industry help some of these non-crypto native companies enter into the space? Um, I, I'll give you a kind of anecdote from, from us, right? We, we, um, we cater to, or a, a lot of our audience is actually non-crypto native just because we're dealing with physical fine art pieces, right? So we bought a, a Banksy uh, last year at auction and that's what we kind of fractionalized and, and tokenized. And um, a lot of people who don't understand NFTs, you know, right click save, screenshot. This is, you know, Particle is a bit of like a gateway NFT for them. Uh, you know, they can kind of wrap their head around it. And so they're like, okay, I can do that. But onboarding these people is, is, is just very difficult if they don't have, you know, the, the, the will, if you want to take, let's say, a couple of hours to actually go, go ahead and, uh, you know, set up their MetaMask and buy crypto, etc. So um, I think there's... There's definitely a lot of room to grow there, and, and, and brands and, and, and us as builders on, on the blockchain need to make sure that the, the onboarding process is as smooth as possible for people who, who are not crypto native. This goes all the you know starts with like custody and, and, and fiat on ramp, and then being able to then slowly introduce them to actually you know own 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 the, the assets themselves and, and, and have custody of them themselves. I mean, I, I would say this in. Let's just be aware of where we are. We're here at the Avalanche Conference in, in Barcelona. Uh, I think Avalanche is a phenomenal you know, L1, and the technology there is really allowing a lot of the applications we have, have hopeful to actually have some, some ability to be executed. And so and the reason I, I say that is because we're, we're at a point now where if we go beyond the art and collectibles, the applications to, to, to retail, uh, coupons, receipts, these types of things to frankly large pools of data uh, that were representative of the individual. These are the use cases that get me most excited and, and the reason why is this. As we think about the data models that NFTs will allow, it's, it's far less sexy than a Beeple or a Board 8, but the ramifications to macroeconomics are, are tremendous. And so we're talking about NFTs being the basis of something as grandiose as a universal basic income. How do we leverage the data models from NFTs so that people can collateralize their data, use it to, to get lump sum payments or, or these types of things that could be truly transformative for those in emerging markets? And for the businesses, you know, if you're a firm like Blackstone and you have literally you know, hundreds of billions of dollars under management and you have a number of portfolio companies, how do you have that apply to the data that's an add value and you turn that to an asset on balance sheet. And in that kind of universe, we're talking about businesses being able to add maybe five to 10% of their market cap to, uh, to, to their market cap. And that's something that will get large enterprise to adopt this across the spectrum. So a uh, number of these are probably a few years out, but these applications will create trillions of dollars of value. And those who have the vision to see it early on, I think are to reap a lot of rewards there. Uh, in terms of, I think the, going back to the question was what's, what's next for, for NFTs, uh, fashion NFTs, retail NFTs. Uh, basically every product that you can hold in your hand is non-fungible at the end of the day, whether it's a pair of shoes or even, you know, coins or a wallet or whatever. And at the end of the day, I fundamentally believe that they'll unlock an entirely new ecosystem for products that you know, we, we can't even think about today. And, and we're starting to see that emerge and, and it's really going to pick up once people realize that, hey, NFTs are not just 
like you said, digital pictures of you know monkeys or, or dogs or cats, right? It, it's everything around us is non-fungible and, and we just need to kind of share that experience with the end cu customers. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so we've talked about NFTs a lot from the industry and the retail perspective. I wanted to touch on the artists and Harold, I wanted to ask you this. I mean, how do NFTs change the way artists work and especially with these physical uh, pieces that then get tokenized, how are they thinking about it? I mean, it, 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 it varies greatly, right? Um, yeah, the digital artists, that's one thing. The, the physical artists that want to get into, you know, I guess tokenizing their, their work, it's, um, you know, you have, you, you guys have heard of, uh, not the artists, right, but Burnt Banksy. So these guys um, who bought a Banksy last year, they, um, they took a picture of it, tokenized it, and then they actually burnt the physical, um, the, the, the physical work of art, and they said, well, now it only exists in the, on the blockchain. Um, so you have some people that, you know, do that. And Damien Hirst did the same thing with, um, with currency, right? You have a year of redemption period, basically, where you can redeem your, burn your NFT for the physical copy um, or, the, or the physical version of it. And then, it, you know, all the physical ones that don't get redeemed are then publicly destroyed. Um, so the value is only in two places for a certain period of time, which is really interesting. Um, I... You know, I, I, there's, there's just many creative ways that artists can leverage leverage NFTs. Physical artists, um, you know, what we do is 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 to is is to actually enable people to fractionally own these NFTs and not need to burn them uh, physically, and you know, be able to retain these these cultural artifacts in their physical form. The way we do that is, you know, we found one way, which, like you were saying, right, this it's it's both. Um, NFTs, and right now it's both a, a technical and a, and, a, and a legal framework that you need to, to put around them. And we've put a lot of work in the, on the legal framework around, around our project. And the way we've come up with it is we, we, if you want, burn the physical value of the NFT by donating it to a nonprofit. And then the collective, the collect, the collective of NFT owners manage, govern that nonprofit. That's how they exert their... Um, their right of ownership over the physical works, and then they have the liquidity of their fraction of ownership in NFTs. So I think it's 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 you know it it it, it can vary. Everyone, what's great about this whole space is that you can be as creative as you want with you know, and and, and it's actually an artistic process in itself of how you actually um, tokenize your your works. Any other? Th okay. Uh, we have a few minutes left. I wanted to ask if anyone from the audience had any questions. Just a question. How many times in your work and uh, how many people in your team think about humanistic point of view? Because humanistic point of view is very important also to, to open this kind of world to most of the people to empathize but how many people do you take care of I mean you mm, how many people humanistic people are you in your team during the process to do whatever thank you let me take a first stab at this I mean I think it's a good question and it's the individual the front and center here we think about web one in the 1990s Think about that as the state of nature. It was brand new. I think people really know what to think. Web 2, and we say this in a former uh, you know, part of the Spanish crown, Web 2 was digital feudalism. This was large corporations extracting the value without regard for the individual and transferring that to shareholders. That, that is Web 2 in a nutshell. We have an onus and a responsibility as, I think, champions of Web 3 to redefine what that social contract ought to be between the human, the individual, and frankly, society. And I think we have, we have a chance. I mean, the Web3 right now, we're at the beginning days of this. It is the biggest transformation of both internet and money since the creation of the internet and frankly, the Bretton Woods institutions in, in the late 1940s. So we have a chance to redefine it, but if we have to be committed to that and we have to make you know, very principled decisions to uphold the values that I think ought to be upheld. Yeah, I think, you know, it, it, it makes sense to me, right, that you, you are 
for lack of a better word, at the at the mercy of the community that or your or the people who buy your 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 your, your products, right? It should be that way. Um, now, you know, while you know, if when you run a business, you you know, you answer to your shareholders. At the end of the day, without your consumers, you're 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 nobody. Um, and so, this 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 kind of new paradigm is 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 I think healthy for for the industry, like you said, because you have to put the consumer first, and you have to include them not only in um, in, in in the direction that your business is going to take, um, but also. You know, possible in, in, in sharing some of the fruits of uh, of of, uh, of your work. Were there any other audience questions? Hi, this one's specifically for Calvin. I'm wondering what you're doing with Legitimate and what uh, similar uh, fidgetal companies are doing more broadly to ensure that you know, with great power comes great responsibility and with these new sort of uh, gateways into the digital space, how do we ensure that this data isn't going to be mistreated or mishandled? Um, is that through ensuring adequate decentralization or is that through building trust with these brands? Yeah, so to keep it really quick, because I know we're over time, uh, Legitimate connects physical products with NFTs, creating the idea and concept of physical NFTs. Um, and we really focus on the last mile layer. Uh, so a lot of different projects have attempted to tokenize you know, physical products through NFTs to increase liquidity or, or provide less friction when, when trading these physical assets as stores of value. What we do is we actually work with brands and manufacturers from day one to integrate specific hardware into the products themselves that can be scanned with any mobile phone. Once you scan it, you can actually claim the NFT and that NFT is bound to that product no matter what marketplace you sell on or no matter what you know, uh, trading mechanism you use. And at the end of the day, you know, one of the things that we really do believe is that you know, physical and digital should remain the same. And, and you've seen multiple instances of projects not doing this. And you know, I, talk to me afterwards, and I'm more than happy to kind of give you a few examples. But at the end of the day, digital provenance and physical provenance is extremely important, especially as it pertains to physical retail and physical art. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Give it up for the panel. Thanks. Thanks.